Hi, I'm Jennifer Hancock. I'm a humanist and um, I want to do a series of videos on democracy in America. And the, the point of this is to help people understand how to be active participants in our democracy. Humanism is a philosophy that says that we all have rights. We're all autonomous individuals, but that we are all connected. And uh, most humanists feel very strongly about democracy, that it is one of the better systems of governance because it allows individuals to have a say in how they are governed. All right. We believe that people are basically good and can manage their own affairs, um, but we need to do so cooperatively. So in that spirit, um, you know, you cannot participate in your government if you don't understand how the government works, how it's set up, where the levers of power are, and how to press those levers of power so that you can, you can participate in your own governance. Right. And, um, you know, it's 2016 right now and we've just, we're just finishing up with the primary season that was very, very difficult for both the Republicans and for the Democratic parties. Um, and there's a lot of people who seem to think those are the only two parties that exist. They're not. There's several parties, depending on what state you're in. Um, the parties vary from state to state. So what I wanted to do is kind of provide an overview lesson on you know, not just how the government is set up, but how the state is set up and how the counties are set up and how the cities are set up. Because we don't just live under the federal government. We have all these different layers of governance and different jurisdictions that they have and, and things like that. So understanding how those governments work, how they work together and don't work together in some cases, and where those levers of power are for you as an individual trying to maybe work with the government to get something done or to create change that you think needs to happen is absolutely critical because without that information you can't participate and if you can't participate effectively then you're going to feel like you don't have a voice All right? and even in systems where you do have a voice if you don't know how to express yourself or you know what the mechanisms are for you to have a say you're still gonna feel like you weren't heard or that the system was unfair and so forth and that might not be the case at all it might just be that you know the, the lever was hiding a little bit and the people that are in the system know where the lever are but if you're coming in from the outside you have no idea alright so that's what this video series is designed to do is to help you do this now I'm doing this video very very quickly I'm like not dressed in my normal clothes um, I'm also not doing this from a script. So my hope is I wanted to get this out quickly because I think it's needed now. And my intention is um, in the fall to do a more professional version of this. All right, with slides and want to dress properly and so forth. All right, um, but if someone wants to write a transcript for this and, and provide that, that's great. I'm going to post it in two places. I'm going to post this on, on YouTube, so it's widely available. But I'm also going to have a bit available at my company, Humanist Learning Systems, in one of my online, online classrooms. There is no sign up for it. Um, you just log in as a guest. But the reason I'm putting it there is because I'm going to be including some additional material like links to our Constitution and links to the Library of Congress so you can see where information is. Links to some books that I think are very, very helpful to understand the philosophy of why things are set up the way they are. Um, because a lot of people are really confused about things and they're suggesting changes that would do the exact opposite of what they want to have happen and it's not that those changes aren't good it's just that you have to understand the philosophy of why they were set up the way they were to make a decision about whether changing it is a good idea or not because all the changes that are suggested um, have trade-offs and if you're not if you don't understand what those trade-offs are you're not going to make a good decision so I'm going to have links to a bunch of that stuff in the back now a quick caveat I'm a Democrat um, and I've been a Democrat all my life now, my father wasn't a Democrat, he was a Republican, but when he was a Republican, it was like a Libertarian Party. Um, and it, it wasn't, didn't have the racism problems that um, kind of crept in and then went away and then crept in. Um, but the point is that a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is specific to the Democratic Party, but it's actually applicable to all parties because the reality is the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are structured in much the same way and they operate in much the same way. Sure, they have slightly different rules about things, but the way they're organized and the way they work and the reason 
they are considered major parties as opposed to a lot of the other parties which are minor parties has to do with how they're structured. So understanding that, you know, if you don't like those parties, that's fine, but understanding why they work will help you if you want to create an, a, a, an actual third party, right? Because um, you have to understand what a party does and how it functions and why it's effective in what it does if you're going to mimic that but with a different political agenda, okay? But I just want to, you know, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is going to be from the Democratic perspective about the Democratic Party, but these, I'm going to keep it general enough so that it is applicable to the other parties. The other thing um, is that I'm from Florida, all right, and that means I'm in the state of Florida, I'm in a specific county in Florida, and, um, you know, as I said, we're, we're not just under the federal government, we're also under a state government and a county government, and some of us are under city governments. And all those separate governments are independent agent organizations, and they all have their own set of rules for how things work. All right, so some of the examples I'm going to give are from the state of Florida. All right, um, but again, I'm going to try to make them general because some of these things are, you know, the general information is the same from state to state, you know. Um, and so it is applicable. Just be aware that some of the examples are going to be specific to the state of Florida and some of the language I use to describe some of the mechanisms through which things get done is going to be specific to Florida, but there are analogs of these systems in other states. They're, they just might be called something slightly different, okay? So let's get started. If you've had high school and you had a government class or you've read it on it, you know we have three branches of government, right? The federal government has three branches of government. We have the legislative branch, the administrative branch, or the executive branch, and we have the judicial branch. And the legislative branch is where legislation gets written, the executive branch is where the legislation gets carried out, and the judicial branch decides whether or not it's legal, all right? Um, and that's the federal government, except that the federal government is this huge behemoth. <laughs> it's like monstrous. Within the legislative branch, we have two houses, you know, the House and the Senate, and they have all their staff underneath it, and all of those, uh, the House and the Senate all have committees, and they have subcommittees of committees, and sub-subcommittees of committees, and, um, and so forth, right? And uh, making laws requires them all to agree, and usually what happens is when a law is passed, no one likes it, because no one got what they want, because it's, it's, by definition, a compromise between different people with different ideas. Now, a lot of people get really frustrated by that um, because they didn't get what they want. But that the fact that we have to compromise to get legislation passed through this system of subcommittees and committees, and then finally, you know, the, the branch, and then the two branches have to agree, and then they have to go into committee to just to, to fix the differences in their bills. That's a feature. <laughs> like everybody looks at that and thinks that's a bug. The fact that we can't get legislation passed is a bug. No, that's actually the way it was designed. It was designed so that no law gets passed unless we absolutely have to pass something, all right? Um, because you don't actually want laws just change tiggly piggledy. You want them to be deliberative and really necessary, all right? So the the fact that we have to argue and that we can't all agree and we can't get along and that in order to get things done, we have to compromise, that's the feature. All right, so if you're getting frustrated by that, understand it's that way for a reason, because the alternative is to have um, an authority, and we usually, in the U.S., we try to imbue our president with that authority um, to make them authoritarian, which is that they decide what happens and they just implement it. All right, well, that's not democracy, <laughs> that's authority. And, you know, America is a democracy, and it's messy. And getting people to agree on what should be done is very, 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 very hard. And the attraction to authority is, is there, but it's a trade-off, all right? You can either have a messy democracy where it's hard to get what you want done, or you can have authority and then hope that the authority wants what you want done. Because if they don't want what you want done, they're, they're going to do things that you don't like. And you will have no say in it. All right, so if you want to have a say, you have to have a democracy, and a democracy comes with messiness and difficulty in getting along, all right? <coughs> so that's the, the legislative branch. We have this executive branch, and their job is not to write the laws, but to enact them and to, to put them into process. And they oversee the biggest bureaucracy in America, <laughs> our, our government. We have, I don't know how many agencies, 
we have um, only a few agencies actually have cabinet positions and then there's sub agencies within them and then sub agencies within them as well spreading across the entire country and you know some of them are the military and the military has you know however many branches <coughs> Even NASA like has, I don't know, six different departments in it. <coughs> or NOAA, I mean. Um, you know, there's fisheries, there's the weather, things like that. So it's big. Okay, so the executive branch doesn't get to write the laws. They're supposed to enact them. And they are um, the head of a massive bureaucracy. All right, now... The interesting thing about it is, though, that we elect them, Congress does not. So, like, I used to be the executive director of a nonprofit organization, and um, I had a board, and the board was my boss. They were the ones who hired me. My job was to, to put into action and manifest the things that my board wanted to do. Now, there was a give and take there. I could tell them what I thought needed to happen. Um, and they could agree with me and not agree with me. I could provide input into their deliberations, but ultimately they had the final say. All right? and, and the president is kind of like an executive director of a nonprofit organization. They are supposed to do what Congress wants them to do, except that in the United States, we, we elect, the people elect our president through popular vote, through, you know, um, the electoral college. So it's not directly... You know, there's kind of a, a pathway there that winds, but ultimately the president is responsible to the people. Now, they have the ability to go back to Congress and say, hey, I'd like to have this done, and I think this should be our budget priorities and stuff like that. But ultimately, it's Congress who decides the budget priorities and, and passes legislation. Now, the one thing that the president does do is they have the right to appoint justices to the U.S. Supreme Court and to the federal benches and to the federal courts. Um, and, but they, they can only do that with consent of Congress. <laughs> All right. Um, and so those are our three branches, right? The, the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judicial branch. Um, but that's not the only government that you live under. You also probably live in a state. I happen to live in Florida. I have a governor. I have two houses, uh, a state Senate and a state house. I've got agricultural commissioners that are at the state level and attorney general. I have a lot of state level people I can elect and I can also elect my representatives in the House and the Senate. Okay. Now, in addition to that, I'm also in a county and my county, different counties across the country have different governmental structures. My county happens to have a county commission. All right. So I can elect a couple members of those commission of the commission, uh, depending on what district I'm in. Um, some people also live in a city, and the city might ha has their own government with their own elected officials. Now, what you end up with as a citizen is so you are under the jurisdiction of several different governments at any given time. You're under, you may be under a city, you may be, you're definitely under a county, you're probably also under a state, depending on where you live, um, and you're also under the federal government. And the, these different governments are all autonomous and independent. And they have overlapping jurisdiction, meaning they overlap in what they're responsible for. And they also collaborate on things, and then they also don't collaborate on things. So let me give you an example of this. Um, Medicaid. Medicaid is a federal program, right? It's was The law was written by our congressmen and, and, and our senators and passed and signed into law by the president. And they allocate money for it, and the money goes to the states. The states administer the program. And um, they, they, every state administers it slightly differently, um, who they cover, things like that. There's some guidelines from the federal level, but it, ultimately it's the state that enacts this. So there's two governments involved in Medicaid, <laughs> if you're a Medicaid recipient, all right? Um, and, we, and we can go on, you know. Um, it, you know, who do you call when you've got a problem? Well, I was stocked. Well, my state has stocking laws. Is it covered under that? Um, actually, no, because my stalker was in a different state. So the jurisdiction for my problem was not the state or the county. It was the federal government because the federal government laws um, cover, have jurisdiction over interstate issues as opposed to in-state issues. So the state and the county couldn't help me with my stocking problem. The federal government had to. So when you interact with the government, it's 
in order to be effective, you have to know which government you're, you need to interact with. And that's not always clear. And it's very easy to get very frustrated, but um, don't be. <laughs> because the hallmark of how our democracy works in America is we do distribute power. Um, we don't like power concentrated in one place, so we distribute that power uh, to make it closer to the people. All right, because you would not want your local library run by the federal government. It wouldn't make any sense. Um, the libraries are, are local. They might get federal funds, but they're run locally by local boards and local officials. The same thing with the schools. The school boards are local. Now, there's federal laws, and there's a, there's a state department of education, and there's a federal department of education, but your school board is local. So there's, there's overlapping jurisdictions and, and collaboration and arguments about who's responsible for what and who has ultimate authority. But in a democracy, we're almost always we're going to try and default to the localist level. Now, yes, that could be frustrating because it would be really nice if there was one set of rules. But you would trade that off with responsiveness. If I tried to get the president to help me with finding a book in my local library, it would be ridiculous. Like I wouldn't get very good service. That's why I have a local library and I'm not going to the Library of Congress most of the time. We do have a federal library. So when you're thinking about problems that need to be solved. You really need to take into the full scope of effect your local, your state, and your federal governments and understand the laws that affect whatever the problem is and how the local, the state, and the federal laws interact and what all the agencies are that feed into that project or whatever it is. Because if you're trying to change something that you think doesn't work, unless you understand the starting point, like what is, what's being done now, you can't make suggestions to fix it. I liken this to like if you're going to create a route, you know, you're going to try and get from point A to point B, well, you first need to know where A is because you can't go from point A to point B if you're not already at A. <laughs> all right? And that means you have to know where A is and what A is. All right. So understanding that you've got these three, three or four levels of government, if you had a city in there, um, that are all interacting, collaborating, and competing for jurisdiction will help you understand this, like where you need to start. Um, you know, because they they all have their little piece of it, and then they all have to work together, and they don't always work together. All right. Now, where what is the basic unit of government? Okay. Um, it turns out it's the best way to think about the the main unit of government is the county. And there's several reasons for this, all right? One is that the federal government is, you know, you can choose president, but the president actually doesn't have a huge amount of power. Um, they do have power, but it's limited. The real power to create laws is in the Senate and the House. Well, the Senate's seats are statewide positions, so everybody in the state votes on senators. The House is much more local and depending on where you live you might have two or three house members in your county i happen to live in a pretty rural area so we have like one representative for about a two county area all right but the point is we're we're electing those people and we're choosing them at the county level in most cases now there's a variety of reasons um why that is you know but and we'll get into that. But if you're talking about the federal house, you realize you're talking about someone who's being chosen at your county level in most cases. All right. The problem with how we choose our, our congressmen is that the rules for how we choose congressmen and what their districts are is decided by the state government. Right? The federal government has no impact and no influence on how congressmen are chosen, congressmen and women. Those rules and those districts are drawn by your state government. All right? So the state government has a governor and an, assi you know, uh, an assistant governor, um, a, a, you know, a attorney general, um, a state house, and a state representative. All right? And it's the state house and the state representatives that draw up the districts that are used by our congressional, federal congressional representatives. And 
I really want to tell you how this is done because we cannot change Congress until we change the laws on how we choose the districts that allow us to choose the congressmen. All right, so every 10 years we have a census. All right, and this is mandated by the federal government. All right, so every 10 years we're going to have a census. And when the census comes back a few years later, that information is distributed to the states. The states then take that information on where people live and what kind of people live where, and they draw up new congressional districts. Now, the ideal is that every district is going to be equal, meaning they have the same amount of people in them, right? So that each representative represents about the same number of people. The Another ideal is that these are going to be compact. We're not going to have a district that kind of slices its way through several counties um, and disrupts the county. We want the people that this representative represents to be very, um, all of the same community, whatever that means, all right? Um, but it's not as easy as all that. I mean, that's not what really happens. I mean, people, the, the redistricting process is so important that people have gone to jail because of it. <laughs> like if it's not done well, if it's done in a corrupt way, um, it, it, it's a big deal. All right. So if you're talking about changing Congress, you have to talk about electing people to the state house and state Senate who will back a fair redistricting process because what we have now is what we call gerrymandering. And I'm sure you've heard this term and I'm sure you know it's negative, but what does gerrymandering mean? Well, it has to do with how we draw the districts. And uh, like, let's talk about Austin, Texas. I'm not in Austin, but Austin is an extreme example of this. There's a variety of ways you can draw districts. You can draw districts you know, to, to change the, the makeup of Congress. One way is to look at all your liberals and create districts where they have 70 to 100,000 people per representative and then take your your conservative districts and make them so each district only has to have 50,000 people representing them and and this is this actually is pretty consistent across the country there are way more liberals than there are conservatives but because of the way the districts are drawn um, fewer representatives represent liberal people because the liberal districts are so much bigger than the conservative districts by number, all right? So instead of having one representative for 50,000 people, the liberals maybe have one representative for 100,000 people, and the conservatives have one representative for 50,000 people, all right? And this could very easily go the other way, depending on who's in charge, right? Um, and I'm not saying the Democrats are any better than this. I just happen to live in a state that the Supreme Court decided the districting was so bad it had to be redone and like I said in Texas they put people in jail for doing this stuff all right so I'm not this really happens all right so that's one way to rig the districting to create an unfair outcome based on population right um, another way to do it is and um, I'm gonna include a link you know a graphic on this in humanist learning system but um, you can create your districts so that they have equal numbers, but you can split up, you know, groups that you don't want to have power and make them a tiny portion of a larger district. So the districts are all equal number wise, but you know, the power of a community is diluted to the point that they don't have any representation at all. And so let's talk about Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas is this city that's really liberal in the middle of conservative Texas and they have no liberal representative for any, none of the people rep in Austin are represented by liberal people at all. And you think, well, how is that possible? You have this city that's very, very liberal with a lot of people in it and they have no liberal representation. How is that possible? Well, imagine your city is surrounded by a, you know, a county and rural areas. And imagine that whole thing is, is you know, cut up like a pie. Well, the larger part of the pie is out in the country and the tiny part of the pie is in the center where the city is. And if you do that enough, then each of those districts might have the same number of people, but the liberals that are in the city have been divided up into small enough communities where they are now a minority in their district because the district includes not just the, a tiny portion of the city and a large portion of the surrounding countryside. All right. And that's how you can use districting to create really, to just basically prevent people from being represented by people who actually represent them. 
All right. Um, and again, the rules for this, and this is done at the state level. The federal government has no control over this except to say it's fair. They don't even have the ability to say it's fair or not fair. The, the fights over this are in the state and in the state courts. All right. Um, now, even if you were able to get fair districts drawn that allow people to be represented and not have their, their community diluted by splitting their community up, um, you still have a problem because redlining and the legacy of slavery. And I tell people this and they're like, yeah, but slavery was so long ago. It can't possibly impact anything now, except it totally does. I live in Florida. I live in a county that was founded, not founded, settled with slave owners. All right. And at emancipation, yeah, people were emancipated and they were turned into sharecroppers and they were given bad land along a strip of land. And on top of that, even when the sharecropping ended and um, we had the civil rights movement and people were no longer forced at gunpoint to pick celery for white, you know, white landowners in the 40s. Yes, it continued to be um, You then had redlining. <laughs> and the, the, the effect of redlining was to keep the black community into certain areas and to keep them away from the whites. Well, the other thing this did is it diluted their political power by making, you know, like... <sighs> Remember what I said about Austin, about how they kind of split up the community and took a little portion of that community and shoved them with a bunch of other people that didn't agree with them politically? Well, and so that they, they had no representation. Well, that happens to the black community all the time. And it's the reason it's possible to do that has everything to do with the legacy of slavery and with sharecropping and with redlining. All right. So in order for the black community in my area to have a black representative, you either have to trust the white people who are here who are descendants of slave owners and aren't even aware um, to vote for someone like that. Um, they actually do create special districts so that the black community's vote is not diluted. All right. And that's a good thing. All right. It's called, <laughs> it's a good thing. All right. And, and the, the problem Florida had in the last couple of years was because they were diluting the black vote and, distributing it out so that they ended up with representation they didn't want. All right. So all of these things have to be taken into account. And we do this once every 10 years. And if your state government is not dedicated to doing this fairly and ethically, they're going to do it in a way that benefits their party. And that's what we had happen in Florida. That's what's happened in Texas. It's happened in almost every red state. And I'm not saying like Democrats don't do it. Democrats absolutely do this too. Um, one of the things I want to see happen is I'd like to have independent commissions, bipartisan independent commissions come up with these districts um, so that we don't have this partisan impact on our districting because it really is that important. In order to get that done though, we have to elect people to the state government willing to enact the law that changes how we do redistricting. All right. And that's not easy to do because it's not just the congressional districts that were done this way. Your state houses and your state representatives and your state senators also have districts that were also determined by the same redistricting process. All right. So in order to overcome these dis electoral disadvantages where a liberal might have to get 56 to 60 percent of the vote in their district to overcome the structural inequalities built into the district by gerrymandering. You have to turn out a huge number of people to do that in order to elect someone who is favorable to independent commissions for redistricting. But until that happens, you're not going to see changes at the state house and you're not going to see changes in Congress because the state decides what the congressional districts are. And in order to change that, you have to change the representatives at the, at the state house and the state Senate who draw up those districts. And you only can do that once every 10 years. I mean, you can, you're electing state house people every, all the time, but the redistricting only happens once every 10 years. And then you're stuck with those districts for the next 10 years until the next census is done. All right, so this is hugely important. If you want to change the federal government, you have to change your state government so that you can change how the districting occurs.
All right. Um, that's where that lever of power is. Okay. Now, the next thing I want to talk about has to do with how we, the mechanics of actually voting. All right. Um, and this has to, and this is done at the county level. All right. Your, your congressional representatives are elected pretty much at the county level. Um, your state and house representatives are pretty much elected at the county level. Your county commissioners are pretty much elected at the county level. And your supervisor of election or your registrar of election or the commission of elections are also elected at the county level. The county, the laws governing the elections are state laws, but the people in charge of actually conducting the polling and the voting are elected at the county level. All right, now I'm in Florida, we call them supervisors of elections in California, the registrars of election and different counties, different states call them different things. All right, so, but I'm in Florida, so I'm gonna call it supervisor of election. All right, so what the supervisor of election does is they've got all of these maps, right? They've got the congressional districts, they've got the state house districts, they've got the state senate district, they've got, um, like we have mosquito control districts, we have count, com, county commission districts, um, you might have, city district, city representatives or city council districts. You have all these different districts and they all have different boundaries and they're not all the same. All right. And then, and some of these districts might be in different, might straddle two counties. All right. So someone in Pinellas County is going to vote in the same district as people in Manatee County are in Florida. All right, because there's one particular district that is gerrymandered to make sure the black community actually has representation and it actually straddles a couple of counties, right? So the county supervisor of election um, is responsible for making sure we have volunteers at the polling locations, making sure what tech they choose the technology that's used. They choose um, the vendors for that technology. They have to get ballots printed. Um, they may or may not send out pre-ballots. They have to manage the absentee ballot system. Um, however, your whatever the laws are that govern voting in your state, the county person responsible for that has to make sure all of that happens. And it's a huge job because one precinct, like the basic unit of democracy is the precinct, right? Where voting actually, this is when you go, wherever you go to cast your ballot, right? That's a precinct. And a county might have a bunch of different precincts and each precinct has their own ballot. And within that precinct, there might be three different ballots depending on where in the precinct, if the precinct is divided up into three different voting districts for different things, you're going to have a variety of different ballots. It's a logistical nightmare. It's a logistical nightmare. All right. So a lot of, when we talk about things like voter suppression, that was a big topic this past year in both parties. All right. Almost always that was happening at the actual polling location, which means it wasn't the party that was suppressing the vote because they don't have control over that. It's the county supervisor of election that's doing that. And they may or may not be trying to suppress the vote. In some cases, they are. I mean, I live in a county that was, you know, has, was founded on slavery. When I first moved here, they did not want me, a white woman, to register as Democrat. Right? And I, they wouldn't, I couldn't figure out a vote for three years because they did not, they actively suppressed the Democratic vote when I first moved here because the Democratic vote was the black vote. Right? And they were actively suppressing the black vote here. Right? They don't do that anymore. I'm, I'm sure they still do it, but it's not nearly as bad as when I first moved here. All right? uh, it's a lot easier now to vote Democrat in this county than it was when I first moved here. All right? But when you talk about suppression of, of elections, suppressor, voter suppression, you're talking about something that's happening at the county level. Yes, there might be a state component to that. All right, Like my state does not allow ex-felons to vote. And there, I think there is a mechanism for them to get their voting rights back, but it's convoluted. Um, they also uh, purge our voter rolls at the state level and then give that information to the county levels to help them purge their voter rolls every election. And it's almost always 
minorities and black people who are being purged from the voter rolls. So, so there is an active voter suppression that does take place at the state level. And again, there are state election officials that have gone to jail in the last 10 years because of their activities at the state level. But most of what is complained about is actually either intentional suppression at the county election level or just flat out incompetence. All right. And it's important to understand the incompetence part and not because the supervisor is necessarily incompetent, but because the task of what they're doing is astronomically complex, <laughs> right? Like there are districts in my county that even in the general election where all the ballots should be the same, have three different ballots depending on where in the precinct you live because the, the districts don't always follow precinct lines. All right, so you're talking about an amazing amount of paperwork that's got to be printed, paperwork that then has to be distributed correctly into the precincts for their polling locations, technology that has to be bought, tested, and, and distributed, the training of volunteers that then are taught how to make sure it goes smoothly, and then the tabulation of all of that um, back at the county. All right, and it it, things happen like even if there's no voter suppression going on even though if you, even if you have a very ethical supervisor of election there will still be problems because it is that astronomical yes but if you want to make sure that this is fair if you're having problems then the, the goal you can't fix that at the federal level you can file complaints with the, the voting rights act but ultimately you need a fair diligent supervisor of elections to make sure this doesn't happen, all right? Because even in my state where the state government does put out these purge lists, the counties can refuse to purge people from their lists if they want to. Like they don't have to follow the state on that. So if you want fair elections that are well run, you need to have a competent person or persons in your super in your elections office, your local county election office. All right? So when you're thinking about voting, a lot of people, they just vote in, in for president, right? And you cannot create change by voting for president, right? You create change by making sure the process is fair at the county level so that you can vote to elect people to the state level who will then in turn make sure that the state rules and processes are fair so that you can elect people who represent you uh, effectively at the federal level. All right, that's how it works. So the basic unit of democracy really is your county. And if you're not paying attention to county races for school board, for commission, for your city council, and for your supervisor of elections, then expect to have problems. <laughs> All right, because that's the first lever of power is at the county level. And you have an amazing amount of power at the county level because this is local politics. It's not like you have to have a crap load of money to become supervisor of elections. It's not like you have to have a crap load of money to become a state representative. All right. Um, you just have to, it's local, it's local politics. <laughs> all right. And the local politics decide the rules for state politics and the state politics decide the rules for federal politics. Democracy is a bottom up thing. And you know, a lot of the complaints people have is because they believe there's this, you know, organization at the top that's screwing us with us at the bottom but the reality is it's probably incompetence at the bottom that's preventing us from building the foundation of democracy the foundation of democracy is county politics and on that rests the state politics and on the state politics is the foundation for the federal politics so if you want to influence things at the, at the federal level you have to start at the county level all right that's lesson one all right now let's talk about who runs for office and how we get them elected all right and again this is kind of a little bit more complicated than than people realize people know we have parties and people are under the impression we are a two-party system well we have two major parties my state florida has seven parties california has seven parties you can go to the state election site and see how many parties there are and what your options are now, the reason the major parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, are considered major is because they have affiliate groups in every county in, this, in every state in the country. 
Like you, you, it doesn't matter where you go. There is probably a local party for the Democrats and the Republicans. Now, my state also has a Libertarian Party. We have something like 89 counties. The Libertarian Party exists in 26 of them. They are not in every county in the state. All right. The Green Party is in Florida. They're in three counties in the state. The Socialist Party appears to be one guy in one county. There's like not even a party. It's like a guy. All right. So we have these parties, but that doesn't mean they're effective. All right. The ones that the parties that are major are major because they're in every county in the state and they have the ability and the volunteers. The volunteers are hugely important. They have the volunteers necessary to recruit candidates and to support those candidates as they run for local, state, and federal office. Because remember, our congressional representatives are also being elected basically at the county level. So you've got your county positions, your city positions, your state positions, and your congressmen all being elected at your county level. That's a tremendous amount of power in the county. All right. So if you want to elect politicians, you need to work with other people to elect them. All right. And that's what the party does. Now let's talk about structure. All right. Because um, I'm a Democrat and there's a lot of complaints about the DNC. All right. So let's talk about how the, the party is, the Democratic Party is structured. Keeping in mind the Republican Party is structured in pretty much the sim same way, except that the rules for how they for how they operate are ever so slightly different. And I say ever so slightly different, they're pretty much the same. All right. So locally, we have a Democratic Party. It's called the Democratic Executive Committee of my county. All right. And every county in my state has an ex a Democratic Executive Committee. This committee is made up of volunteers. There are no state pa paid staff people at the DEC level. They're all all volunteers, all right? So if you're going to say these volunteers are corrupt, I'm going to say, what? <laughs> you know, they're volunteers. They're not making any money from this. You know, they're doing the hard work of making sure we recruit people for public office. We give them the training they need so that they can run for office and can be effective in office. And then we support them and help get out the vote to make sure our fellow Democrats know that this person is running and know that it's important and know to get out to vote for them. All right. This is why um, there are very few like Green Party people on school board. Right? There's no Green Party here to recruit and support a candidate for school board or county commission or supervisor of election or state house. Right? The volunteers are what make that happen. And again, they're making that happen for everything but state senate and president, right? They're controlling the state parties are responsible for getting like-minded people like them elected to all the other positions in all these other government agencies, all the, you know, your state and federal and congressional and county districts. All right. So if you want to have a change, you have to do it at the county level, which means you have to organize volunteers at the county level. And that's what a party is. All right. Now, because some of our districts overlap with other counties, we need to collaborate with those other counties because we have candidates that are running not just in our county, but in the neighboring county because the district straddles two counties or maybe three counties. Well, the, that collaboration is done voluntarily, not through, you know, a top down thing, but it's bottom up. And at the state level, we collaborate through the state party. And the state party is organized by the county parties sending representatives to the state. That's what the state party is. Now the state party might also raise money. They might hire staff to help run the state party because it's a much bigger organization. <coughs> but ultimately the people who are deciding the rules for how the state party operates are volunteers in the county, from the counties. Right? So if you want to have an impact on the state party, you need to get or participate in the county party in order to get elected at the county party to represent the county party at the state. And the Republicans operate the same way. All right. And then from the state, the states have to co co cooperate and collaborate too. So that's what the national party is. It's actually states sending representatives to a national convention to collaborate 
on agendas and rules and marketing and, and things like that. All right. So the National Party is not a top of either the Republicans or the Democrats. It's not this, you know, it's not an oligarchy dictating what happens down at the county level. It's the exact opposite. You have county people getting elected to state and state people getting elected to represent the state at the, the National Party. All right. If you wanted to take this over, it'd be very easy to do. You just have to take over the counties and then get yourself elected to the state and then use the state to get yourself elected to the national. And then there you are. You're done. It's surprisingly easy to do because most of the counties are desperate for volunteers. And like I said, the Republican Party works the same way. And their purpose is to get like-minded people elected to office. So if you don't like the Democrats and you don't like the Republicans and you want more, you want a third party choice, the way you do that is to not focus on electing a president. The president is probably the least, con I mean, they're, they're very consequential, but in terms of actual power to change how, how our democracy functions, they have no power to do that at all. All right. The rules are written at the county level that then elect people to run at the state level who then write the rules for the federal level. To change that whole system, you have to start at the county. You want a, a third party or a fourth party or a fifth party, they exist, but they're not that effective because they don't exist in every county. You want them to be effective, you need to start organizing them in other counties so that they can compete, not just in a single county, but in all the counties. All right, so that's, that's what the parties are. So the idea that a state party could dictate to a county party what to do is quite frankly ludicrous because that's not how the parties are organized or work, right? We live in a democracy and I can assure you, I'm, I, I can speak for, for my county party, um, but I'm very sure the Republican party that's local works the exact same way in that we're a democracy. And we like to distribute power to the people down here. And we're very suspicious of giving our power to the people up here. And every time we have an argument about states' rights, that's what we're arguing. Do we want to centralize power or distribute the power to the people? And there's a trade-off. There's benefits to centralizing power and there's benefits to distributing power. And finding that balance is what's so tricky. But whenever you're talking about changing the rules about how we elect people to different offices. This is the underlying debate that you're going to have and that you need to have. All right. Because if you want to give party to the state power, you have to address the concerns that the people at the local level have who are going to lose that power locally. All right. And a lot of what we see in terms of um, like the primaries, every state chooses delegates to the nominating convention differently. Right. Some of them are like the Democrats, all our primaries are proportional, but the Republicans, some of them are proportional. Some of them are not proportional. Some of them are open to people outside of the party. Some of them are closed to just party members. Um, some of them use caucuses. Some of them use uh, ballots and some of them use a hybrid of the two. Um, guess what? All those rules are written by the state party. The state government doesn't even have a say in how a party chooses to nominate people to represent them. Right? Those choices are all made by the state party, which is made up of volunteers who were elected by their fellow volunteers at the county level. All right. So this mishmash of things that's so confusing is not evidence of corruption or um, conspiracy to force an outcome, it's actually the result of distributed power sharing. <laughs> All right. And again, there's a trade off between one and the other. So when you're talking about, well, should we consolidate power and make everybody standardize versus allowing the states to decide for themselves, this is a discussion about centralized versus distributed power. And democracies, by definition, are supposed to be as much as possible about distributed power because the closer you get to the people, the more it's democracy. All right. And I'm not saying there's a better way or, or less better way. I'm just trying to explain how the parties function 
and why the rules are the way they are and why they differ from county to county and state to state is because the decision making is distributed as far close to the people as possible. All right. So if you're feeling let, left out of a presidential nominating process, you know, be aware that you're not. All right. Um, you know, the parties are open to anyone who wants to volunteer with them. The Democrats and the Republicans and the Greens and the Socialists and the Libertarians and my county has a Tea Party. Um, they're all open to, they'll take any volunteer they want, right? There's almost never a primary for like county commission. There's almost never a primary to choose a nominee for one of the parties to the state house because there's almost never enough people running, all right? But it's kind of stupid to say that the, the national party is going to dictate who's running for state house in my county because they, they don't have any input on that at all. It's a county decision, all right? And if there's two candidates, we're going to have a county primary to decide who the Democratic nominee is going to be for the state house. Um, and the Republicans have to do the same thing, all right? So you want to get involved, you're invited to the party. Choose your party and then participate. But if I have a party and I invite you to it, and you refuse to come, you say, I don't want anything to do with your party, then you don't get to come to me and complain that I didn't include you. Like it was your choice not to participate. So if you're mad about closed primaries, you cannot complain to the national party about that because they have no ability to dictate to the states or the counties how those state and county parties operate because they're independent organizations. The DNC, has, the DNC and the RNC have no power over the states. The states have power over the national. That's how it works. It's bottom-up democracy. All right. You want to participate. If you, you know, if you choose not to participate in a party, you've made a choice, and that choice comes with consequences. And you have to accept those consequences. That's what being an adult is all about. All right. If you want to participate in a party, then participate in the party. If you don't want to participate in the party, don't participate in the party. But then don't complain that you weren't included in the party. That's all I'm saying. All right. Now, if you want the party to change its rules, there is a mechanism for you to do that. All right. And that mechanism is to join your county party, participate, encourage people to run for county and state party office that agree with you on the changes that should be made to the rules and get them to the state party where those rules are written. And if you want to change the national party rules, it's the same thing. You start at the county, you get to the state, and then you get to the national party. All right. But the national party does not have the ability to dictate to the state parties how they operate. If you want to change how the parties operate, you have to change the way the counties operate so that you can get people to the state party, so that you can get people to the national party. And it's surprisingly easy to do because there aren't a lot of people volunteering in the county parties. All right. So those are the parties. Um, and again, their job is to find like-minded candidates and support them in their runs for office. And most of the work is done at the county level. There's, we only need to collaborate at the state level for state level offices like governor and, um, and attorney general and our state senators, right? All the rest of the work is done at the county level, right? And the only reason the state parties need to coordinate is to coordinate for the national election, which is for president. All right, and this is the same for all the parties. All right, so if you're looking at a third party and saying, well, why aren't they effective at nominating someone for president? It's because they're working at it from a top-down standpoint, and that doesn't work in a democracy. Democracies are bottom-up. They really are. And the reason the major parties are effective is because they start at the county. The foundation of democracy is at the county level. All right. And now let's talk about money in politics. All right. Um, running an election is not cheap. All right. Even at the county level, we have candidates in my county, my rural county, spending $100,000 to get elected to county commission. $100,000 to run for county commission. It's insane. It's an insane amount of money. All right. And what that money is buying is flyers, phone, you can't have a phone bank if you don't have phones and electricity, right? You can't print out, 
you know, walk lists on whose door to knock on if you don't have computers and printers, right? All of these things, even though it's all volunteer, almost all volunteer driven, this all costs money. If you want to coordinate the activities, then you need a paid coordinator who can dedicate themselves full time to doing this, right? So that's what it takes to get elected to county commission. Yeah, it would be nice if we got money out of politics. I'm all for that. I'm all for public financing of elections, but we're not going to get public financing of election unless we elect people who want public financing of election to the state or county governments. All right. You can't just say we want this at the federal government. If you can't get this enacted at the county or city level, you have to get it enacted there to get the people you want into the state government so that they will enact public financing at the state level so that you can then elect people who are sympathetic to public financing to the federal level. Bottom up. This is not, it's very tempting to go top down, but it's almost never going to work top down. You have to start at the county and build yourself up, all right, with the financing issue, all right. And so that's the ideal, right? But in the meantime, we have to accept that there's a huge amount of money in politics, all right. And where does that money come from? Well, it comes from individuals who might support the candidate, um, you know, and let's keep it local. Like I've got, um, you know, a, county commissioners running, I've got um, state house representatives running. So we're talking about very, very local elections. Um, and again, huge amounts of money in there. Well, some of the money comes from local fundraising where the candidate themselves is raising money. And yes, of course, they're going to like and be beholden to the people who give them money. But one of the, the benefits about the party, and I know people are complaining, well, you know, the DNC is getting all this money from really big businesses and the same thing with the RNC. But what they don't realize is that that money, by the time it gets down to the county level to help with county level operations, we don't know who donated that money at the, at the federal level. We don't know who donated the money to the, the federal party. We only know that the federal party gave it to the state and the state gave it to the counties. And so our allegiance is not to the actual donors who were three steps removed from. It's to our state party and to our national party. And that's actually better than having individual candidates beholden to individual business owners who gave them money individually, right? Because at that point, they're representing, able to represent and they know their power base comes from the party itself. And the party itself is made up of volunteers, all right? Not corporate businesses, volunteers, the people, again, distributed power. So even though there's large sums of money being raised at the this national level to these parties, by the time the money comes down, it's completely irrelevant to the person running for county commission or, you know, state house. Because they don't know who gave money to the DNC chairman or the RNC chairman. All they know is that their party is helping fund them and get them elected. All right. And that their party is made up of people who are volunteering their time. All right. So if you're really concerned about, I understand the concern about the big money and it's a necessary evil at this point, but getting hugely worked up about it for, at the, in the party structure, is um, is misplaced at this point because it's preferable to the direct donation from businesses to a candidate, if that makes sense. Right? It's not ideal, but at least it's so the power, the the influence is diluted to the point it's non-existent by the time it gets to the county level. All right. Um, now another way to influence. Uh, your politicians is not just to be in a party and supporting them and working to help get them elected so that they are grateful to you for having getting elected and they know who their constituents are because you worked with them and met them and hung out with them for several months before the election. The other way is what we call um, special interest groups, all right, and PACs, um, political action committees and things like that. All right, now the PACs and the super PACs have a really bad reputation. But they really only have a bad reputation for the PACs we don't like. Most of us love our PACs and we hate the other people's PACs. <laughs> All right. Um, and it's kind of important to realize that. Like, I'm a member of several PACs 
And all a PAC is, is a group of people who have gotten together to push a particular agenda. So I'm a humanist. I support, you know, secular PACs, PACs that promote a secular non-religious agenda to take religion out of, say, child abuse, um, you know, to get rid of the religious exemptions for child abuse, for instance. Um, I collaborate, donate to lobby politicians, and yes, that involves giving them money because we don't have public financing yet, um, to support their candidates, the candidacies of people who support this agenda. All right. And there are going to be PACs you agree with and PACs you don't agree with. Um, but even in a public financing of elections scenario, people still have the right to peacefully assemble and have their voices heard. And that's ultimately what a political com action committee is. Now, the super PACs and stuff like that are, are these community organizations on steroids. All right. Um, but the idea of getting together with like-minded people on a shared agenda to influence and talk to politicians about that shared agenda, to try and get that shared agenda enacted, is democracy. All right. The corrupting influence of money is absolutely there. Um, but even if these political action committees didn't raise money and didn't distribute money to candidates, they'd still exist as a way for people to get together for common cause for political purposes. All right, so one way to do that is through the party. Another way to do that is through political action committee. Um, you know, and again, yeah, the money can be a problem, but, um, you know, what's at issue is, is whether or not the people have the ability to get together and to combine their power and their voices to lobby on behalf of whatever the political agenda is. And that is an absolute yes for democracy. Um, you know, the question becomes how do we maximize the good and minimize the hard harm? And that's a question for another time. What I'm going to tell you, though, is that joining and becoming active in various political action groups is not a bad way to exercise and leverage power. All right. One way is to get involved in local campaigns to make sure that, you know, people you like are elected because almost all of the positions you're going to ever vote on are local. The other way is to, you know, once people are elected, not give up on them and not think your work is done, but continue to push them on issues that you are concerned about. And, and the reason for this is like, okay, I'm a member of Democratic Party, but the Democratic Party has a very specific platform of what we stand for. And I might have issues in addition to that, that I care about that the party is not pushing because it's not part of their platform. Well, I join another group and use them to help push that. All right. Um, but again, this is all local. All politics is local. You've heard this before. All politics are local. That's where the levers of power really are. All right. So if you want to create change, you need to start by making sure people who agree with you with your structural agenda on how democracy should operate are elected at the local level so that they can write rules that are fair to help make sure that people who share your values can be elected to the state level. And then those people write the rules that help make sure that the rules are fair so that we can get people who share our agenda, whatever that agenda is, whether you're conservative or, or liberal or socialist or libertarian, doesn't matter, so that you can get people together that represent your values at the national level. Right? That's how it works. Bottom up. Keep saying this. Bottom up. All right. Um, so yeah, now if you have a policy agenda you want to see enacted, you have to figure out where the overlapping, um, where it overlaps between your various governments are. Like I said earlier on, Medicaid is both a federal program and a state program and a local program. Um, libraries and schools are both federal, state, and local. All right. So understanding the overlapping jurisdictions and, and, who's responsible for what will help you get that done. Um, what I don't want you to keep thinking is that all the changes we need have to be done at the federal level. We can't even begin to change the federal level until we change the states and we can't begin to change the states until we change the counties. 
that's how democracy works. It's very, very frustrating. It's very, very messy because we distribute power. It's not centralized. It's distributed. All right. And again, feature, not a bug. Now, one last thing about this, about being an active participant in democracy. Because power is distributed, it means that decision making is distributed and not everyone's going to agree with you. Like you might want a particular policy to be enacted. Um, I would like there to be no religious exemptions for child abuse, for instance, um, among other things. I would like fair redistricting. I would like independent commissions to bipartisan commissions to do districting. I would like there to be multiple parties. I would like there to be public financing of elections and any number of things that I want to see happen. All right. Um, but there's people who don't agree with me on that, right? Gun control. We don't agree with it. Abortion rights. Americans don't agree on that. There's any number of things we don't agree on. And even at the county, we don't agree on things, right? Uh, I was talking to someone just today about the subject of, um, you know, how we elect people, how we do the nominating process. And that really is a conversation about whether we centralize power in the DNC or we keep it distributed at the county and state levels, right? And there's pros and cons on that. And we might not agree on that because not because any side is corrupt or evil, but because there's a benefit to distributed power and there's a benefit to centralized power and there's drawbacks to centralized power and drawbacks to distributed power. And we are necessarily going to disagree on what the right balance is. Right? It has nothing to do with corruption. It has nothing to do about not caring about the issues. It, there are legitimate disagreements on that. And understanding that those at their core these disagreements can be very very rational will help you understand that the need to collaborate and compromise a lot of times in politics compromising is like considered a bad thing but it's a necessary part of how we function as a democracy you're never going to get your way and if if you want your way so badly you're willing to convert a democracy into to a dictatorship so that someone can dictate what you want to see happen. You're making a devil's bargain. All right. Because the next dictator might not agree with you at all. All right. So the whole point of having the decision making distributed is to prevent dictatorships from happening in the parties and in our federal government. All right. It is a trade-off. All right. And that trade off is that if you're going to have distributed power in order to get things done, you have to compromise, period. All right. That's not a bad trade off. And most people would say, actually, that the compromises create better legislation. You might not get everything you want. You might think the other person's an idiot, but the compromise is necessary because we do distribute power and ideally and Theoretically, each individual has an equal say in what happens. And yes, it's almost impossible to even get a county party made up of 10 people to agree on things. Imagine how hard it is to get the state party to agree or the federal party to agree, let alone the governments. All right. But there's, again, it's a trade off. All right. So, how to be an active participant in democracy while still respecting the democratic process and not getting so frustrated that the solution is authoritarian dictator, right? Which is that everybody's got to do it the same way um, and one size fits all and we're going to take power away from the lower groups, right? That's just terrifying to most people. It's terrifying to Republicans. It's terrifying to Democrats. It's terrifying to people who want democracy. <laughs> all right. So, in order to make sure everybody gets heard while still making decisions, you have to compromise. And the key is knowing what to compromise and what not to and trying to make deals that everybody can win with. And that's not so easy, but understanding what the alternative is to that the alternative to compromise is dictatorship. And I'm not exaggerating that. <laughs> you know? So, um, yeah. You want to be an active participant in democracy, you have to respect people who disagree with you. You have to participate at the local level 
and build things. We always talk about grassroots. Yeah, that's what it means. And it's incredibly hard to do, which is why only two parties have managed to do it. <laughs> and one of them is currently kind of falling apart. All right. It's very hard to create a national movement that is fundamentally founded in the power of the grassroots. But that's exactly what the parties are. It's exactly what the parties are. And it requires compromise. All right. So um, that's a basic overview on <laughs> how to be an active participant in a democracy. And again, I apologize for it not being like this is not a professional video. But I wanted to get it out there to help people understand uh, what happens, why it happens, and where the levers of power really are so that you can create the change you want to see, whatever that change is. All right? Thanks.